Good morning. Good morning. All right. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm actually going to just skip ahead a little bit because thank you for the excellent uh, introduction. This is myself and Anthony. Uh, as we mentioned, I'm the SVP of production at Pro Media, so I'm one of the guys who's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, being boots on the ground, helping some of these great ideas actually come together and become a reality. And Anthony is... I'm the EVP of Pearl, and uh, I'm the guy who gets to work with the brands to kind of figure out what it is they're trying to communicate, what their goals are, what their objectives are, and then we kind of create that big idea through that. So I am, uh, I'm at that position, and I'm basically Daniel's worst nightmare. Um, because I'm responsible for trying to figure out how to activate all the things he's promised to the clients. I wanted to skip forward and show you this, um, this slide because I thought it was funny, and Isabel did a great job of introducing us. But the introduction slide is the anatomy of an experience. So Anthony and I were here last year at Creative Tech Week, and we did a presentation called The Five Pillars of Creating a Great Experiential Campaign, or Creating a Great Experience. And over the years, we have kind of worked up these five things that we think go into creating a great experience, and we always show and talk about the experience, but coming to Creative Tech Week and knowing that some of you are the thinkers and doers and the people behind creating new experiences, we wanted to look at what actually goes into an experience. We, we so much only see the experience itself, and we never really get to learn about the brains, the heart, and the guts that go into creating some of the amazing things, um, this being one of them, that, that we do on a daily basis. Yeah, so um, everybody wants that product, right? Everybody comes to us and say, we want to do this, we want to do that. They have an idea or a technology they want to use. We focus a little bit more on the idea. We have a large skill set of technologies that will integrate into our experiences. We're not a vendor. We don't have a product. We don't have a, we're not a 3D projection company. We're not an interactive company. We're an idea company. So the end goal is to get that recap. But what we're going to do today is talk to you a little bit about how we get there and, and then the meteor nuts and bolts of, of all the details that go into that sexy polished piece. Because that recap video that goes online that gets a million views, that video last year that came up the box, by the way, we spent hours trying to figure out how you did it before, before the nice. breakout came out. It's a beautiful video. So, uh, But that's, the, that's what we do. We, 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 we look at the recap video and we know that there's so much more of the reality behind it. So many people behind the scenes making things work, so many ideas, so many pieces of technology that maybe are being used in a brand new way, right? It's not that we are create, we often do not create new technologies. We just create new ways to use technologies that you're already familiar with, right? We're just sort of building a better mousetrap to use that that old cliche we're looking at a problem from a different angle and figuring out how to take an older piece of technology and suit it to a newer problem and most of these uh, begin with a conversation about what the client is trying to do and that's where this guy excels right is starting that conversation yeah and in this particular project it started with a a sentence, I'll read it to you, it says, we want an interactive storefront to talk about JetBlue and then surprise people with tickets. So I said, all right, let's get on the phone. That's probably the best thing to do here rather than email. And we get on the phone and the first thing I believe the creative director said is, how do we build a software that knows when someone's there and can view, with, let me stop you right there. And this is sort of what we do best, right? I mentioned we, we use a lot of different technologies, but what we try to do most is understand how to use it in the space that we're going to engage with the consumer. So um, we had some really good collaborative discussions and we decided that we were going to build a, an interactive experience using an actual JetBlue flight attendant because no one at JetBlue, or I'm sorry, no one who doesn't work in JetBlue can wear the uniform. So she works at JetBlue as a flight attendant. She does have her SAC card, one of 32 JetBlue employees who have that, who were auditioned for this role. Um, and we, we decided we're going to build replica studios. There were going to be an interactive experience and then a custom studio live experience that brought this to life. So without trying to explain it to you, let us play the video. Hello, welcome to the JetBlue experience. Please select a topic to get started. Okay, what do you want to ask about? Entertainment? Snacks. Snacks. We like food. Legroom? Sure, please. Legroom. JetBlue offers the most legroom and coach of all carriers. So feel free to stretch out in those zebra print shoes. Please select another topic to learn more. 
Customer service. JetBlue offers award-winning customer service. Oh, I didn't know that. Good job. <laughs> good job. Thank you. You're a good job. Okay. <laughs> Please put your sunglasses on. Please put your helmet on. Repeat the question much slower. Next. Alright. Please step away from the microphone. Oh, step away from it. I wouldn't trust a man wearing a helmet and a hat at the same time. <laughs> So this is a really fun one, right? We, we like to call this a surprise and delight stunt. We basically set the consumer up for a little bit of surprise, and then they, they are delighted as a result. In the case of the JetBlue uh, wingman, we call this a better wingman, everyone who participated got two free tickets to wherever JetBlue flies in the continent of the United States. So it was a huge program for the, the passerby. They just got two free plane tickets for interacting um, with our hostess. But let's talk about the process a little bit because that video is awesome and it's one of our favorite videos to show. But so much went behind this, this campaign that you don't see in the video. First, the campaign ran on, on uh, 6th Avenue and 16th Street. It ran for four weeks. So the first three weeks that we went up, we had just the screen with a directional audio speaker. So this is a speaker that um, we, we mounted up on the ceiling and we pointed down at the ground and it only makes a six foot audio circle on the ground. So if I'm standing here, I cannot hear her speaking to me. If I take a couple of steps over, I can hear her as though she's talking to me or whispering in my ear. So we're using that technology as a way to stop people on the street. Imagine you're walking down the sidewalk and then you hear someone talking to you, you can try and look and you see her standing on the screen. But you can only hear her if you're standing in front of her. So we did that for the first three weeks and we ran coming soon messaging. And at the beginning of the last week, we set up basically a film studio inside of the storefront. So this campaign is a lot about the day of production, right? One, two, in this particular instance, three days of all-out production work. So the storefront's kind of dead until we build this execution. We set up a studio in Boston when we first met the flight attendant, and we filmed her there. And then we made an exact duplicate of that studio in the storefront. We took exact measurements of her distance from the camera lens, the background, the lights. We had the exact same light kits, cameras, everything. So that the picture that you saw of her pre-recorded on the screen and the picture that you saw of her in the studio looked exactly the same. Right, and that's like that's where the devil's in the details here because there are going to be a lot of people on the three days we were live who just show up and that's the first time they ever see this experience. But there are a lot of people that walk out of that subway station that's right at the north side of the storefront or just pass that on their daily you know, routine that we wanted to at least be able to pull the shade on them as well. Um, <clears throat> to talk a little bit more about the technology, one, if you'll notice, they, inter uh, they, they begin their interaction by touching the screen to ask about a true blue reason to believe, right? One of the, one of the best qualities about JetBlue. And this is something that we do frequently. We put touch screens in storefront windows. We use a product um, from VizLogix or from Spyglass one of the touchscreen or a touch foil integrator companies. And it gets applied to the inside of a piece of glass. And basically the electromagnetism in your fingertips makes it a huge trackpad. You can use it as a mouse. And the entire program, other than the surprise and delight, hinges on that piece of technology. And when we got to the storefront and installed it, it didn't work. Don't know why, still to this day don't know why. The best rationale we can figure out is that it's a double pane window with fresh argon gas inside to, uh, for temperature control. The argon gas would not let the electricity, electromagnetic pass through the glass. So, quick huddle, he and I figured out a plan. We, we took the touch foil outside to see if it would work outside, and it did. So, we just audible. We mount the touch foil on the outside. It presents some 
danger for your technology. Your consumers can now touch it, but we just try to hide it to the eye as much as possible. So we apply the touch roll to the outside. We used CAT6 USB extenders because it's a USB tool to run the wiring, cabling 70 feet. And then on the day of, we created a huge production. I believe there were over 30 people on set for three days. We have four fixed cameras. We had two roving cameras, two audio professionals, one directional speaker, four microphones, right? We had a DP. We had uh, a, 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 co a comedian feeding her lines, watching people on the street and feeding her lines with an earbud. I mean, it was a crazy production. But it's one of the most exciting things that you never get to see, right? We don't actually get to go inside and see what's going on behind the scenes in these. Anything else you want to say about that one? No. I think there was some food. Yeah, we need a little bit of food. Yeah. Um, everything craft everything services. you can think of when you have to house an actor, right? They need a trailer. They need create craft services. They need someone to come and uh, they tell them when they have a break, right? Just all those little things that go into a production that happen just to create that one video. What's the one thing I haven't told you about this yet? How much it costs? How much do you think it costs? 20000 20, <laughs> Anybody else? Who said 250000 Very close, right? Anywhere in the range between two hundred thirty-five to $275,000 for a program like this. And your costs are exacerbated by the length of studio time that you want to create all of this great surprise and delight footage, right? Because that's where you're spending most of your money is having all of these people and all of this equipment in one place and produce that one time. And in reality, uh, a bunch of these people were seeded. We like to call them seeds. So we put out um, uh, a brief RFP. We're looking for people who want to engage with a brand. We don't really tell them about what, what they're going to be experiencing. We kind of stage them to come in every hour or half an hour, depending on how many people we're trying to put through the experience. And what we do is we try to get some seeds to come in and give us some good footage. And then once the seed is interacting, you build up some public awareness of what's going on. And then we get rid of the seeds and try to bring in some natural people, you know, some regular passerby. Another question? How many tickets did you 100. 100 plane tickets. And that was all JetBlue. That's not included in that $250,000. Yeah. I mean, this was sort of the beginning of, we had done a lot of interactive straight, you know, programming uh, type style programs with them and now we've done a lot more exploratory work with them so they love this space in fact about a month after they did a program and some of you may have seen it where they bought a bunch of bus shelters around New York City and uh, and they were actually rede redeemable you tore them off and they were redeemable for you know Brooklyn Nets tickets or season passes to the Met or whatever um, and you had to just read the fine print and see that and uh, so they love that sort of space and and I think, you know, I know we did the seven-figure views on YouTube and all of that. We got a tremendous amount of coverage in the trades, and, uh, and they keep calling us. So I think they're happy. Air on the side of humanity. So they've been running. They started that campaign with the, uh, with the pigeons and how the pigeons are sort of mistreated in New York. I don't know if you've seen that one. This is an extension of that campaign, air, the Air on the Side of Humanity campaign. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. And so we go from one that's like a surprise and delight to something that's a little bit more purely experiential. And this is a program that we did for AT&T called Pressure Point. This was a, this is one of the few times that we actually get to do the idea that we came up with. We work a lot with major national brands and their agencies and creatives and the brands themselves have their own ideas. And more often than not, we're asked to just engineer it so that it works. Uh, this was a dream project of mine. I, Went to college to play basketball, still play a ton of basketball, and kind of just wanted to get free tickets to the Final Four at some point in my, uh, in my life. So I kept going to every NCAA, NCAA sponsor who would listen, and I said, I have this idea. We're actually going to recreate the feeling and the sentiment of shooting the game-winning shot at the, at the, game, at the uh, national championship. And everybody had some love towards it. It was always a budget or a timing or, or whatever issue. Um, I even went over to the NBA. I took it to all their sponsors and saw if, uh, if they'd want to do that for like an all-star weekend experience. But as some of you may have experienced when you go to these types of events, the tactile is really hard to replace with technology. It's, it's very hard to say there's a virtual basketball experience when Coca-Cola's got a full court and people dribbling basketballs and shooting on 12 hoops and being able to do exactly what it is you're trying to kind of recreate. So you need some sort of fantastical integration and that's where this idea came from and it became a, a case of like right time right place the 
it's called the pressure point. AT&T was going to promote its Pulse product, which is their home and life automation product. And, uh, and the idea of heightening one's pulse with this sort of pressured environment of actually trying to win the national championship with one final shot fit right into their, into their mantra, into their theme. And so that's when we were able to do this last year uh, in Houston. The Final Four is a unique beast. The energy, the excitement, the highs and lows of March Madness is unmatched anywhere in sports. It's the goal and dream of every player to be there. AT&T wanted to connect fans to the Final Four in an impactful way uh, by dropping them into the most exciting and stressful moment in all of basketball, the game-deciding shot, in a way that only AT&T can. The AT&T Pressure Point. It all started with the physical structure. From the outside, you have no idea what's going on until you're about to go in creating a bit of the fear of the unknown to get the heart going a little bit. Once inside, it was pretty simplistic. Court, hoop, refs, but then we decked it out with AV. So to make this idea a reality, we had, uh, we had four projectors shooting custom content on the sidewalls. We had six spotlights. We had a surround sound audio system that was comparable to about a 5,000 person concert venue. And we had programmable LED lights behind the hoop. But what really took this concept over the edge were the butt kickers. We wanted to mess with people a little bit, so we put these amplifiers in underneath the ground from where they had to shoot. When they got up to shoot, we started rattling the floor beneath them, and it got more intense as time went on, right up until they took that final shot. So we created a dynamic four camera solution that was set up around the space to capture the player's shot. Based on when the ball hit the rim, our software would automatically capture the best shots for each player and then stitch the camera feeds together to create a compelling consumer video. Using a biometric device, we tracked the consumer's heart rate throughout the entire experience. This allowed us to record in real time how the consumer was handling the pressure. The consumer's heart rate was then applied to the final video, and giving an additional layer that not only showed their shot, but also to illustrate the physical reaction to the experience. Thank you. I, uh, I personally don't think Anthony gives himself enough credit. I mean, that is really one of his brainchilds. He had SketchUp drawings of it. He made PDFs. He had originally it was four bays. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt was... you. Can you just say that one more time? <laughs> it was Anthony's brainchild. And it was one of the most exciting things that we, we have actually done in a little while. Uh, contrary to JetBlue, AT&T Pressure Point was all about the pre-production, or a majority of it, I should say, was about the pre-production. If you noticed, during, during the actual shooting, right, so the, the customers there and they're getting ready to shoot the ball, we had three different scenarios that were projected on the walls on the left and right of them. So the challenge we're faced with is, when you're standing on the, the free throw line on a basketball court, the court itself is massive, right? And how do I replicate the pressure of being on a court with 40 or 50,000 people around me when I'm actually standing in a little box? And what we did is we recreated that by shooting, actually creating film shoots, two different days of film shoots with 10 or 20 different actors. All of them had brought six outfits. So you would wear one outfit and you would do your scene and then you would change and do another scene. So we turned 10 actors into 60 actors. And then we cut them all up into these pieces and project them on the walls. That's how we're sort of building up this pressure point, right? Um, speakers, I think we had 20, no, 10,000 watts of sound. We brought six subs and we plugged two of them in. And then Allstate across the convention center came over and was like, can you guys turn the music down, please? You're rattling the windows at our display. And that was our point, right? We wanted to put a consumer in this little environment and, and really take them away from this massive convention center that they were in and make them feel like they alone were standing uh, on the field and getting ready to shoot. Let me talk about the actual process of playing the game. 
We showed you in the video the automation of how we captured consumers' shoots, or shots rather, by, uh, with the four automated cameras, and then we had a program to stitch it together. What you don't see in the, in the video, in the promo video, is as they get to the stage and get ready to play, there's a two-minute intro, a video that plays that's sort of setting the scene. And then we build up the pressure with one of those three scenes that I was talking about, and they have 10 seconds to shoot the ball. What's happening? If they shoot the ball, there's a 50-50 chance that one or another thing's going to happen. What are they? They're going to make it or they're going to miss it. I need to then have a reaction from the crowd, right? If I'm feeling like I'm actually standing on the floor, I need to have the crowd either go wild when they make the shot or kind of get deflated when they miss the shot. How do we do that technologically? We talked about 20 different ways to do it. I can put a dip sensor in the basket so that when the ball falls through it, it knows it's hit it. I can try to put some sort of uh, a camera or, or, or uh, IR sensor on the backboard so that the the backboard knows if the ball is missed. And this guy was like, what if they miss the basket altogether? You know what I mean? Then we're not touching anything. Then we can't figure out how to play one command or another. So it came down to the simplest of programmers, human operator. We literally had the two scenarios programmed out on a button, and someone sat behind the room looking through a peek in the curtain for five days. For five days, for 10 hours a day, and they would just have their finger on one of those two buttons. When the ball went up, if they made it, they hit a button, and the crowd went wild. And if the ball missed, they hit it, and the crowd, you know, kind of was deflated. Um, but it's, the, it's those little things that you don't see that go behind this. And to, Anthony, you know, to go back to Anthony's point about JetBlue, you can sort of, we can talk a hundred different ways to do a magnificent technological structure that will make, that will fire these two cues for us. But at the end of the day, do we need to? Can we think around a project or a problem in another way to use the technology that we know and that we, we trust and just use it in a different way to, to get the same desired effect? What's the thing I haven't said? How much does it cost? What do you think? Anyone? 200000 for this. And this is just for us. So what, what that means is pre-production, video, uh, projector, projection, audio, on-stage crew, including uh, projectionists, audio tech, and PAs, and then the butt kicker system. And that's it. So all the other stuff, the footprint, the, um, the application, the biometric, and all that is a part of a separate, separate budget. Any questions on this one? Yes, ma'am. That's the recap of all the equipment that went into that one. And we, again, we just kind of wanted to touch briefly on recap versus reality, that the stuff that looks really fun and pretty upfront oftentimes has a couple of really serious uh, dudes in the background trying to help you figure out how to put all the pieces together, um, whether you're doing something new or whether you're doing something old and trying to make it feel new. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.